Hello everyone, and welcome to this mini-lecture on Edgar Allan Poe and the Black Cat. So many people are familiar with Edgar Allan Poe. He is probably one of the most famous authors that we read within this course, and of, you know his, his writings are still read today. He's still a well-talked-about author, um, and he's a very impressive author if we consider that he only lived 40 years. Uh, and his works are still regularly adapted, regularly used as inspiration for other stories. Uh, just, you know, in anthology, you know, every anthology of American literature seems to always have Edgar Allan Poe or any horror, author, any horror anthology ever published always seems to have Edgar Allan Poe in it as well. So, in his life, um, he lived a very strange life, um, which clearly comes through in his writings, uh, but he was orphaned. Uh, he ended up li he ends up go living with his uh, uncle, I believe. Uh, he was a gambler, and that got him into trouble several times. Uh, he served in the military, which not many people not many people knew, or I would say even believed, right? Because we have Edgar Allan Poe, who seems, if we look at the picture here, you know, he he's very much painted as the poster boy for um, really what we would consider people who dress in goth. Uh, they seem People who dress in goth seem to... The, the, there is a large fascination with Edgar Allan Poe and the things that he writes and his dark tones and whatnot, so you wouldn't think Edgar Allan Poe himself served in the military. He also married his cousin, although that's not entirely un unheard of in the 1800s, uh, but it is, again, one of those other oddities within Poe's life. He was very influential, and I think this is important. He was influential in a lot of different areas. The short story uh, existed prior to Poe, and we've certainly seen that, but Poe was one of the people to really embrace it, really kind of give it a definition, identifying it as something that you can sit down to in, you know, a single set in a single sitting and enjoy, uh, and really really do it well. He's clearly highly influential in horror, and I don't think there is a modern horror creator today who can't in some ways be traced to Edgar Allan Poe or was inspired by Poe or, you know, owes some some debt to Poe. And lesser to a lesser degree, although still truthful, he was also influential in development of science fiction as a genre, and some of his stories do have a certain scientific slant to them. And he was really influential in detective fiction, and not everybody un not everybody knows that. I mean, he created one of the earliest serial characters uh, in detective fiction, and that character shows up in the uh, the the Purloined Letter and Murders in the Room Morgue, both of which are short stories in which you get two of the iconic. Styles, or what two of the uh, not styles, two of the iconic um, elements of of detective stories in the Murders in the Room Morgue, you have the locked room scenario in which a murder takes place, and there's no real way to explain how it took place because all the doors are locked from the inside. And then you also have the the giveaway in the purloined letter, in which it's determined uh, the, by the detective where some key piece of evidence is because of where the person guilty is looking or that the person gives away the crime unintentionally. And we also have Poe highly influential in poetry, not so much in the America, not so much in the United States. Um, his poetry really isn't valued as much, but he was very popular in France. Um, his right, particularly his poetry, was quite popular, um, and they even at one point brought him over to France as part of that celebration of his writing. So. We have this story, The Black Cat, uh, which itself has been rendered or, or adapted in many, many different ways, and you know, in film, in old-time radio shows, in comics. Uh, it was originally published in 1843 in the Saturday Evening Post, which is a very famous publication uh, that lasted up through the 18 uh, through the 1900s. 
So some of the characteristics that we see within this within this short story that are worth noting. The first is that the story is a first person account. So the story is told through the point of view of the narrator, the first person point of view. Uh, and that's always an interesting experience because the narrator is telling the story and we always want to be suspect of our narrators. We can't assume they have an objective grasp of reality. They have a very subjective grasp of reality. We all do. It's not just the narrator. But in a story, if an author is using that first person narrative, we want to be aware of it and we really want to question what is the narrator telling us and what isn't the narrator telling us. <clears throat> this story is also a confessional, right? From very early on, the narrator tells us that he's confessing. He's telling us what he did, and hopefully with that some reason. Of course, any kind of confessional, you can't expect the truth to always be the truth, right? You can't expect there to be some subterfuge going on. <clears throat> And with all of this, what I want to emphasize just is the unreliability of the narrator. In fact, that's a common trait in Poe's stories, particularly first-person stories, is that we cannot trust the narrator. The narrator is suspect. Uh, but this is true in all, in all first-person narratives, is you cannot trust the narrator. They're often not reliable. Some more than others. And some, you know, it's clear they, they're lying even to themselves. And we also want to ask about the sanity of this character. In fact, in several of Poe's stories, you know, the, the question of the sanity of, of the narrator is always up for question. And a good example of this is the Telltale Heart, where, in the, again, the first few lines, the narrator, you know, questions or says, raises the question of his own sanity. You know, am I mad? Am I mad? Right? This happens a lot in Poe's stories, that we really have to question the sanity of the, the narrator. And sometimes that's because of what has happened. The narrator has been exposed to something that has shaken his reality to its core. Uh, we also see hints within this story of addiction. Uh, there is some question around um, the character and his, his addiction to alcohol. Um, there's several mentions, mentions, there's several times that it is mentioned uh, his, his temperance. And whenever you hear the word temperance, you're talking about alcohol addiction. So <clears throat> let's look at the opening to this, this short story. For the most wild yet most homely narrative, which I am about to pen, I neither expect nor solicit belief. So he's writing, I don't care whether you believe me or not, right? Which is always, always, a, a, and it's, it's, you know, when it's done in writing in, in a story, it's always an attempt to build credentials, right? I don't care whether you believe me or not, I'm going to tell my story. And so because of that, we're now more likely to believe the story. And again, here we have that madness. Mad indeed would I expect, would I be to expect it in a case where my very senses reject their own evidence. So he's already telling you, I, you know, I would be mad to expect you to believe me because my senses reject the actual evidence. Yet mad am I not. And sure, and very surely I do, do I not dream. So here again, he's, he's trying to assert, I am not mad. Of course, the second you say you're not mad, people start wondering if you are mad. But tomorrow I die, and today I would unburden, unburthen my soul. My immediate purpose is to place before the world, plainly, succinctly, and without comment, a series of mere household events. In their consequences, these events have terrified, have tortured, have destroyed me. Yet I will not attempt to expound them. To me, they have presented little but horror. To many, they will seem less terrible than Baroque's. Hereafter, perhaps, some intellect may, find, may, may be found which will reduce my phantasm to commonplace. Some intellect more calm, more logical, and far less excitable than my own, which will perceive in the circumstances I detail with awe, nothing more than an ordinary succession of very natural causes and effects. So there's a lot here in this. Um, and I would encourage you to go back and really try to unpack it. But listen to and just be aware of kind of how he's trying to set the story up, the narrator that is. My, you know, he says, my immediate purpose is to place before the world plainly, succinctly, and without comment. A series of mere household events. Of course, 
we get anything but that. He's regularly being wordy. He's regularly providing comment, right? He is doing anything but just telling us what exactly occurred. There's all these little side elements. There's all these little things that seem questionable. Um, you know, and of course he's talking about these, these events have terrified, have tortured, have destroyed me. And there is an egocentrism of this character that you'll see throughout the story. It is all about him, regardless of what happens to anybody else. It is about what happens to him. And that he has been terrified and tortured and has been destroyed, regardless of all the horror that he has wrought amongst other people. Um, so really pay attention to the ways in which you know he, he claims this is a very very natural causes and effects and, and it's anything but it's not natural causes that generate this story from my instant my, from my infancy I was noted for the docility and humanity of my disposition my tenderness of heart was even so conspicuous as to make me the jest of my companions I was especially fond of animals and was indulged by my parents with a great variety of pets this peculiarity of of character grew with my growth in manhood I derived from it my principal sources of pleasure so again he's fr he he's gone into this introduction he's, he's told us you know this is crazy you're not gonna believe it and now he's trying to say from a kid I was docile and I and I was humane right and in fact I was teased by the other kids for this I and I, I loved animals and I continually had a great variety of pets of course you want to ask the question, was indulged by my parents with a great variety of pets. What happened to those pets? It's always a good question to ask. He had all of these pets. Why did he need to have all of these pets? Did he just keep, in a, a, keep them all together? Or did they keep dying? Or worse, were they killed? Right, it's, a good, it's a question to ask because we're dealing with somebody that is we're assuming is mad or seems to not be entirely there and he talks about a great variety well exactly how many pets are we talking about and what happened to them especially when he talks about you know he continued into his adulthood okay I I married early and was happy to find my wife find in my wife a disposition not congenial with my own <clears throat> Observing my partiality for domestic pets, she lost no opportunity of procuring those of the most agreeable kind. We had birds, goldfish, a fine dog, rabbits, a small monkey, and a cat. So let's look at that first sentence. I married early and was happy to find my wife, find in my wife a disposition not uncongenial with my own. I married early. Well, how early? And what do you mean by early? Early for your age or early before you had the chance to find out more about your wife? Right? Because he was happy to find in his wife a disposition not uncongenial with his own. So when we look at that sentence, it's fascinating because it's saying, yeah, I rushed into marriage and I just happened to find out that my wife also liked animals as well. So I think that's, that's a really fascinating sentence here because we have to wonder with Poe, you know, is he setting us up for what comes later? Is the narrator, not Poe, but the narrator actually believing the story he's telling us? Or was all of this, is all of this just a rouge to kill his wife or and to blame the cat? And there's a good, there's good grounding for why I asked that. <clears throat> So he talks about the you know he he this cat that comes into their lives. The latter was a remarkably large and beautiful animal, entirely black and sagacious to an astonishing degree. In speaking of his intelligence, my wife, who at heart was not a little tinctured with superstition, made frequent allusion to the ancient popular notion which regarded all black cats as witches in disguise. Not that she was ever serious upon the point, and I mentioned the matter at all for no better reason than it happens just now to be remembered. So we get a couple different things here. He's talking about his wife being superstitious. Of course, he's the one that decides to bring it up and bring it up for no real reason. Right? So we're getting him giving us commentary that he promised us we wouldn't get. And <clears throat> he's mentioning the superstition, not his wife. Pluto, this was the cat's name my favorite pet and playmate. I alone fed him and he attended me wherever I went about the house. It was even with difficulty that I could prevent him from following me through the streets. Now for those that don't know, Pluto of course is the is not only the name of a 
of a star that we sometimes call a planet or not, but it is also the Roman god of death. And so we have this interesting imagery of Pluto, that is death, right? So think about this, what the narrator says next. Uh, death, if, if we replace death with Pluto here, death, this was the cat's name, was my favorite pet and playmate. I alone fed death, and death attended me wherever I went uh, about the house. It was it was even it was even with difficulty that I could prevent death from following me through the streets. So when you just switch out those names, Pluto and Death, or the you know the god of death, we see a very very morbid picture start to arise. One day she accompanied me with some household errand into the cellar, and this is the wife, into the cellar of the old building which our our poverty compelled us to inhabit. The cat followed me downstairs and nearly throwing me headlong exasperated me to madness. So of course he said he wasn't mad, here he says he is mad. Uplifting an axe and forgetting in my wrath the childish dread which had hitherto stayed my hand, I aimed a blow at the animal which of course would have proved instantly fatal had it descended as I wished. But this blow was arrested by the hand of my wife. Goaded by the interference into a rage more than demoni demoniacal, I withdrew my arm from her grasp and buried the axe into her brain. In her brain, she fell dead upon the spot without a groan. So, in an attempt to kill the cat, he kills his wife instead. And this is his reaction. And this is why I think, or I think there's something in here telling us that it's not really the cat. The cat is the superstition that the narrator has given us, but it's the wife whom the narrator has wanted to kill. Listen to the first line after, after he kills his wife. This hideous murder accomplished, I set myself forthwith and with entire deliberation to the task of concealing the body. There's no remorse. There's no, oh my God, what have I done? It is, I killed my wife. Right? This hideous murder accomplished. All right? Accomplished, right? Let me check that off my to-do list. I set forthwith and with entire deliberation to the task of concealing the body. I knew that I could not remove it from the house, either by day or by night, without the risk of being observed by the neighbors. Many projects entered my mind. At one period, I thought of cutting the corpse, the, cutting the corpse into minute fragments and destroying them by fire. At another, I resolved to dig a grave, for it... For, uh, for it in the floor of the cellar. Again, I deliberated about casting it into the well in the yard, about packing it in a box as if merchandise with the usual arrangements, and so getting a porter to take it from the house. Finally, I hit upon what I considered a far better expedient than either of these. So he kills his wife and without any remorse moves into, oh man, I've got to get rid of this body. And let me think of all the different nasty ways I can do it. I can cut her all up. I can throw her in a well. I can mail her, right? I can FedEx my, you know, this dead body somewhere. So it's in this moment that I think we see a very, very fascinating different story come out than the black cat. I don't think the black cat is what the narrator wants to do. Upon its head, with the red extended mouth and solitary eye of fire, sat the hideous beast whose craft had seduced me into murder, and whose informing voice had consigned me to the hangman I had walled the monster up within the tomb. Right, and I just, you know, the the idea that the cat had seduced him into into murder, that somehow it was the cat that convinced him. Again, our character takes no responsibility, takes no. Um, has no sense of what it is that he's really trying to do. All right, so that is our brief introduction to Poe and the Black Cat. I hope you enjoy this, and I will see you in the next video.